Hey, you geeks. Thank you for all the support this last week. It's been a year since I had my beginning on the wheel of time with New Spring. Reading one book per month, more or less, we've had highs and lows. And now I finally found The Slog, where Jordan stretches his writing chops thin. Half the book is spent explaining what other characters were doing while the climax of the last book was happening. Since this is a slice of life story, it makes you realize that every pony is the star of their own story. I'm going to focus on the side characters who I normally gloss over in my reviews. Unfortunately, Dr. Hooves is not among them. Then carry on with world building, magic system, and plot. Spoilers for all books up to this point. Fail. I can't entirely blame her for Perrin's mental state, though she takes it as a matter of course that he will drop everything and search for her. Oh, goody. We've been tracking the Shido on their incredibly convoluted journey across the Westlands from Dumai's Wells to Malden, and I finally get why Jordan kept them. If he'd just had the White Cloaks capture Fael, which I presume was the original idea, Perrin and his army would just crush them. Instead, we have to watch as Savannah makes the worst out of Wetlander and Aiel customs alike. To combat the tyranny, Fael is making new friends, like Aravine and Roland. So, now we know why the Song of Roland is considered barbaric compared to the noble knights of Camelot. Theoric Kareed is far more interesting than any of the A storylines Jordan has given us. Wow, maybe we should have stuck with that storyline. We learn he's property? As in all Death Watch, Seekers, and Sojin, the three highest servants of Shan Chan society are slaves. Somehow they even outrank Soldom. Through him, we learn that Tuan was a nice person at one point, and gave him a doll for saving his life. Yet, for all of Egyanan's talk back in Tarabon that the Empire was orderly, it sounds like the High Bloods have all the order of feral cats tied in a sack. Despite this ongoing insanity, Kareed keeps it cool, even dealing with a seeker for truth. A true model of army intelligence. I have a complete record on you. I know every move you make, everything there is to know about you. So watch your step, Honeycutt. I'm Pierce. Thinking the White Tower would send Tom Marilyn, a man, to do a woman's work. Creed was right to leave him behind when he departed with all the Ogier gardeners, Suldam and Damane, who were particularly loyal to Tuan. It's almost sweet, except their departure means that Matt is in even more trouble, and now the only one watching Suroth is that fool Seeker. Suroth is certainly up to something. Either her or Tuan's MIA truth speaker, who is so suspicious that I dare not Google her lest I get spoiled. We begin with a fake Daughter of the Nine Moons going about with fake Death Watch guards, and the dice rolling whenever it appears Matt will lose the pleasure of Tuan's company. There were also those dark hounds. Did Surath send them after Tuan and they miss? Why else would dark hounds circle Perrin's camp and not attack, besides giving us a reason for expositing the origin of dark hounds? They were elves. taken by the dark powers. And giving this book a semblance of early tension, even in the crawl of book one, we had Trollocs attack. Here, Dark Hounds almost attacked. But I guess that doesn't cut it. 
By the end, there is talk that Surath has made a treaty with someone important. My first thought was she made a treaty with Masima, then sent the Darkhounds to check on him. Though calling Masima a great king is stretching it. Then the epilogue dropped, and it appears Surath will be sending her fake daughter of the Nine Moons to go meet the Dragon Reborn. Cup of tea. No, no. A cup of tea. The true hero of the first act. Elaine's tea was quite bland, and she thinks it's on account of her pregnancy, but compared to the food going bad and the dead walking, could it not just be the Dark One's touch? Jordan squeezes a lot of recap between teacups, but no action besides a jump scare. We've spent three books already dealing with Sea Folk, Kin, Aes Sedai, and Dark Friends. Though the tea dutifully comes along to meet the new, annoying, child nobility, none so fierce as the young bear. I think we've had enough small talk. Why are you here? Throughout it all, Elaine's chapters, like her tea, was quite bland. Just as Egwene's chapters, like her tea, were quite bitter. Egwene. I would say that Halima, or Arangar's plan to break the White Tower by giving Egwene headaches, is the stupidest plan I've ever heard of, except it worked. Mainly because Egwene is, well... You're a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. She universally distrusts everyone, even though she considers friends. Except Halima. Egwene immediately jumps to the conclusion that Rand used compulsion on his Aes Sedai when she doesn't even know if he knows that weave. Though, for we're jumping to conclusions, she's not far off. But that was Varen's doing. It never occurs to her that acting as Armorlin, making novices and sinners alike quaver in their skirts, acting as the embodiment of a self-assured Aes Sedai, If an item does not appear in our records, it does not exist. Is doing exactly what Rand was doing back in the Fires of Heaven. Even worse, her reaction to negotiations with the Tower is just short of Elida's unhinged response to negotiations with the rebels. Just short because Jordan writes it in Egwene's perspective, but a third party may have interpreted her actions as deranged. I hated Egwene through these chapters until I realized she must be under compulsion. She, for no reason, throws out Loghain as a possible Sidene murderer when she herself set him free on condition he'd head for the Black Tower. That is the clearest instance, besides her blatant blindness to Halima's position. Everything will be fine. Everything will be fine. That I can tell she is compelled. The rest is unclear, and unfortunately, Egwene was already the sort of person who would terrify Nynaeve for messing around in Teleron Riyad when Egwene was doing the same thing, but worse, back in the Waste. I can't blame all of her behavior on Halima, but the ambiguity doesn't help me like Egwene any more. Look like we're doing. It's manifest destiny. You can't fight it, neither can I. It occurred to me that Robert Jordan saying the Shan Chan have Texas accents makes perfect sense if you consider everything in Altara sort of like a Western. I highly recommend taking a shot every time the words wagon and paint are used within three words of each other. It proves absolutely nothing, but it sure does make the book more interesting. For starters, Matt's description of The Return sounds like my favorite scurvy-ridden educational game. Howdy, partner. Let's head out west on the Oregon Trail. 
Also, the Old West theme meshes well with Perrin trying desperately to not become John Wayne from The Searchers. So we'll find him in the end, I promise you. We'll find him. Just as sure as the turning of the earth. And now he's enlisting the help of Texas Rangers. You go tell your pa that a company of Rangers, all 14 of them, fully armed and equipped, will be in the field by daylight. To fight the Comanche. I mean, Shido. The Shido are a lot less sympathetic than the Comanche. I know it sounds crazy when comparing an imperial line descended from Arthur Hawkwing, now led by an empress, may she live forever, whose social structure makes the Forbidden City look tame and uncomplicated. Yet there they go with their longhorned cattle out to claim the quote, new land for their country and to spread slavery. It may sound ridiculous, but so do their accents. Warriors. Over the past few books, we've had Ashaman take Aes Sedai as warders and vice versa. Only a few of those have been with, quote, consent. Crossroads of Twilight finally discusses these things openly and makes me very uncomfortable. Jahar's Aes Sedai the one considered good with warriors, is openly grooming him. She took his dragon pin because it had come from Rand, not her. She thinks he has to learn to take things only from her hand. <laughs> it's a very low bar to say she's at least not using the bond to compel him. Though if Aes Sedai could do that to men who could channel, then why hasn't Alana gotten Rand in line? Now, both halves of the White Tower aren't planning on showing such restraint, with the Tower in Exile openly speaking of using compulsion on men who can channel, while Reds just want to take full advantages of the bond. The Reds might actually be nicer to the Ashaman than the Exiles. <sighs> Not by much. The Axe. I finally know what it feels like to be disappointed by a Perrin chapter. The page turned from a strengthening storm to when to wear jewels was a huge letdown. At first, I was worried Perrin's entire story would climax in a man going shopping. Take it like a man. I'm beginning to wonder why I should still care about the White Cloaks if they weren't in So Habor. Discovering ghosts and rotting food isn't particularly pleasant, but the ghosts don't do much. We've seen armies clash before cities, magic revive the dead, and blast cities from the earth. A Haunted Town is first act finale material, and that's what this book feels like, the end of a first act. Perrin's emotional arc does come to an end when he finally sets down the axe, though I'm not certain why cutting off one on Shido's hand is suddenly worse than killing them at Dumai's Wells or killing White Cloaks in book one. Not that I approve of torture, but this is supposed to be a deep insight into Perrin's character, and I don't get it. The bow. Matt courting Tuan is just as cringe as Mr. Elton courting Emma, except Jane Austen wrote her story poking fun at such ridiculous courting rituals. Jordan's writing has no such mirth, which is odd because this is Matt while Rand and Perrin have finally learned to interpret women, Hallelujah. Matt has lost his touch. While Rand only understands men as far as the cheat code Elaine gave him allows, Rand still can't see that Elsa is crazy. And for Perrin, it's his nose who knows. Meanwhile, Matt is somehow absolutely miserable while traveling with a circus and courting his future wife. This could have been fun, for me, the reader, at least. 
The only time I shouldn't be having fun in a Matt chapter is when he's killing women. He's killed a few of those before now, and the dark friend he killed in Kyrian was in that book's final act, but he had done considerably more in the Fires of Heaven than skulk in the rain. Even if all this is incidentally keeping Tuon out of the dark Sean Chan's grasp, ordering Rena sniped from afar isn't enough to give his arc weight this book. The Chain I find some humor in that Egwene's attack plan is to make an unbreakable chain. That's very Aes Sedai of her, though I wish her plot had been more focused on rediscovering Kulandar and less about what I ranted about earlier, or when the tower discovered Forkroot. I thought Elido was keeping that a secret. Now I wonder how deep did Arangar's sabotage go? She was clearly killing off the sisters Egwene wanted to use in this attack, so she knew about the plan. Did she want Egwene to be captured by Tarvalin? Though the likely outcome of this is that the exiles fold and order is restored. Or is Arangar so confident that she can send the exiles into utter chaos without their head? Whoa, look at them scramble! And if that was her long-term goal, then was Egwene relieving Bodwin truly an act of a woman who has learned from her forebears' mistakes and demonstrating an ounce of human decency, which I can only hope because this might have been Halima's compulsion. Without that greater context, I don't know how to feel about this ending besides mild disappointment. I hate to ask it, but was Jordan losing his touch before he died? One book to go to learn if Jordan's magnum opus was worth it. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.